Okay, here for a Bolt 12 UX jam session. Um, I don't have a, you know, like a strict agenda or anything um, for uh, this call. Um, just, uh, you know, I can here to answer questions for anyone who's interested in working on this. Um, talk a little bit about what I'm doing and this might just uh, honestly devolve to, into us uh, monkeying around uh, in Figma. Um, so uh, I'd, I'd kind of shared some stuff about what we were working on um, from a Volt 12 perspective uh, in the, the Volt 12 Discord. Um, is there anyone here who's kind of unfamiliar with that? You want like a refresher maybe? Always good. Yeah, okay. So um, I've got this document right here, Bolt 12 Design. I'll go ahead and copy this and share this here in the chat. And uh, I think everything else is probably linked to from this document. Um, we had a lot of designers uh, popping into the Bolt 12 Discord. So I decided to uh, uh, try and put some structure around like what exactly is needed in this space. I'm at a high level at the top of the document. I kind of just uh, describe um, uh, what exactly Bolt 12 is. You know what we're doing here. Uh, basic gist is, you know, it, it can do a lot of things. Like long term, there's a lot of things Bolt 12 can do. But primarily, what we're interested in right here um, it, for the very immediate future is the things called offers. And uh, what offers are going to do is uh, make it so that you can have a reusable payment identifier. So the current Lightning invoice it expires. It can only be used once. It's a very very annoying to the user experience. Well, 12 offer could be reused uh, indefinitely um, as long as the node is online and you know accepts that offer it can be used indefinitely. So this means that this paves the way for um, a uh, you know a kind of like a payment identifier uh, that you can use that is static and doesn't change and you can publish and anybody can pay you with it. So that's kind of the primary use case. Um, in, in terms of the, the three things uh, that that um, I think designers can help with on this is you know really just ux ui guidance for industry adoption we're going to have this kind of period where um uh once uh we have bolt 12 out in the wild um it, it's not going to be a situation where everyone adopts it overnight so we have a couple of different lightning implementations uh, working on this now the, the idea is that you know sometime uh, this year or probably very soon we're going to have one of them um merged in and then other implementations will follow so it could be that by the end of the year we have uh, uh, a lot of lightning implementations that support this but then the wallets have to support it and it's like this situation where if you take an offer qr code and you make that the default for your wallet and uh not every other wallet supports this you're you know going to create a lot of confusion uh, with users so currently looking at ways to mitigate that um, with uh, potentially with uh, unified QR codes, potentially with some other techniques. Um, so I think we can provide design guidance there. Um, then, then once uh, wallets start supporting this, I think we can start uh, tracking which uh, wallets do and don't support this. So something like uh, the unified QR project or when Taproot, um, like how we kind of uh, track uh, adoption of these standards here. That's always very helpful for the industry. Um, and then also the bolt12.org website. Um, it just kind of hasn't really been updated in a long time. Um, but more importantly, uh, the bolt12 website in its current form, it speaks um, uh, more to like protocol level developers, like people like Jeff here. Um, but like also like we need to start thinking about the application level developers, um, the people who don't necessarily need to be um, as deeply involved with the, the nitty gritty of the lightning spec itself, but the people who are actually building wallets and other services um, uh, on top of Bolt 12, and then the designers who design for those services. So, um, you know, we want to look at it, you know, updating this website um, to kind of talk about what offers can do, um, you know, why they're important, what kind of benefits they can give your users, um, uh, maybe some guidance on how, like if you're an app developer, uh, what resources you might use to start adding offer support into your product. 
Um, and then we could also uh, merge some of the, the like tracking about who does and doesn't support it into uh, this website as well. And we would of course keep uh, Rusty, Rusty's awesome protocol level information. Um, we would just wanna make sure it's updated to the current, the current spec. And we would have like a section on the website that would still have this information uh, for, for protocol uh, developers. Um, so it's kind of like the three the three areas I think right now that uh, designers um, can uh, contribute uh, to this. Um, any any questions before I plow ahead? I think it seems pretty clear. I'm looking at the Ball Twelve website right now. It's the first time that I see it, but I guess the points that you made with regards to answering the questions, what's in it for you? Um, I think those are some good ones to answer um what are the benefits of actually using it because now we have how it works we have who and we have deployment <clears throat> yeah exactly and we have all this stuff and like i said this is all very like speaking to other protocol devs um like like we need to and this is good for protocol devs but we need to start talking to the app devs you know we need to we need to start talking to the people who are building the services and stuff um, I started looking into a little bit of uh, trying to figure out how we might, um, you know, more easily onboard users for this kind of stuff. Um, so, like, uh, similar, we had uh, for uh, Bitcoin QR, let's see, we had uh, these kind of sample QR codes um, here. Um, this was the, the campaign um, that we were working on last year um, to, to try and kind of push for this standard. You can put it on chain and a lightning and at the same one. And uh, so I've been kind of modifying that. So I get this uh, uh, sheet that I started here and I just put a regular BIP21 with a Bolt 11 invoice and an on chain address. Same, we were testing all outside. I put that in there and then I made a new one that has a Bolt 12 offer. And so you can see the QR code gets a little bigger. It becomes 356 pixels wide. And then I did another one with what we call a signed offer and another one where I just lowercased everything, which makes it take up more space. And uh, um, hey, Jason, welcome, welcome to the call. Or, oh wait, just admitting them. Uh, I think Jason may have just joined. If so, welcome. Nope, they're there. Hey, welcome, Jason. We're just talking about both 12 here. So, yeah, I mean, I was testing out the kind of QR code at different sizes, seeing how they get bigger, worked on my iPhone XS. Uh, Michael Riani tested uh, on his uh, iPhone 14, worked very well. He started uh, testing on an older Android phone called a Samsung A10, and he had a lot of problem with these really super dense QR codes right here. Um, but I uh, had a good conversation in the Discord today. Jeff is uh, helping helping me out with um, trying to get some updated QR codes because the offer that is contained within this, basically like what I've done is I went and I just appended, um, what is it? I appended and offer equals, and then I crammed the, Q, the, the offer in there. So Jeff was letting me know that that is um, kind of, uh, that's older. So I pulled that from the existing Bolt 12 website. And the spec has changed a lot since then. So he's working on getting me some updated offers um, that we can test with. So I think that once he's able to provide those, um, I'll need to kind of change this spreadsheet around. Um, and uh, I'll get back in touch with Michael and we can start testing all of these QR codes with the fresh uh, offer ones. Um, I think what it's looking like at this point is that, um, there, there's also this privacy feature in Bolt 12, right? And it's it's called a blinded paths. And basically, like you know, the, the general gist of it, uh, as I understand, is like you know, the more blinded paths you route through, you know, the the more private or more confusing, you know, uh, it is to track your payment. Um, the the kind of caveat to that is that the more blinded paths you use, um, the the bigger your offer QR code starts to get. Um, so if you don't care about privacy, you don't have to use any blinded paths. You can basically just put your own node in the blinded path field. And so you can keep your offer much, much smaller. But if you do desire privacy, then you can start, um, then you can start adding blinded paths in there and then your offer becomes bigger. So Jeff is um, going to give me some that, um, you know, opt on the less private side and some that are on the more private side uh, of that. And then we, we can test how that affects it. Um, from there. So 
um, yeah, I think we'll we'll put a pen in the QR code testing um, until we receive those. Um, but I think that I'm I'm still somewhat optimistic that we can um, test this out, uh, or that we might be able to get BIP21 to work for this. Um, I, I just noticed when Michael was testing his, he was testing them straight from the spreadsheet here. And so the QR codes were like shrunk down like real tiny on screen. I mean, you see how tiny this is. So I want to get like a, a uniform mean test. Like I want to put them in another Google doc. Like I went ahead and started setting it up right here. So I want to get them all in this document where they kind of display at a more uniform size for everybody. And then we can start testing from there and being like, okay, like, can I test it from six feet away? Can I scan it from six feet away? Can I scan it from two feet away? Can I scan it from one feet away? All that. Other we can start building up some more, uh, more reliable data um, based on that. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll get to that, um, you know, when we get some fresh offers, I think. In the meantime, though, we can certainly start, uh, you know, thinking about, um, you know, uh, what kind of stuff we might uh, want on the website and on a campaign and all of that kind of stuff. Um, so uh, if uh, I don't know if if um, if anybody does anybody have any questions or comments or any points they want to raise, because other than that, I'm probably just going to jump into Figma here and start trying to get creative. It sounds like a yes, good idea. Even to yeah. yeah, I was just going to add a little color around the blind to path since I, I know it's a new concept for a lot of people. Um, so typically when you make a payment, uh, let's say prior to Vault 12, um, you know, an invoice may have some routings and those typically are used for uh, private channels or unannounced channels, if you will. Uh, so if it's a node that doesn't have any public channels, you need to have the, the payer needs to be able to find a path to route that payment to you. Um, so that was the, the reason why those are there. They, those could be multiple hops. They tend to be just one, but they could be more than one. And you could provide multiple hints as well. So it could be like two hints that have two hops each, for instance. <clears throat> now, going to Bolt 12, um, there's a similar concept, except now they're, they're blinded. So um, there's basically some fancy cryptography that makes it such that you don't actually know which nodes are involved on those paths. Um, and there's a trade-off between, like you said, between privacy and sort of the, the size of these, these QR codes. Um, so for instance, you may have, uh, you may have an offer of one, uh, one blind of path, maybe it contains two or three hops. I think those are probably gonna be the, the limit to the size, I'd imagine, before it gets too out of hand. Um, that said, these are nodes in the network, and if they disappear for some reason and you provide a blind of path um, that contains that node, um, you're going to have a problem, or you know, the person who's requesting the, the invoice will have a problem um, trying to find you for, for that. So there, there's some subtlety there as far as you know what can be, um, I guess, trade-offs maybe between how many um, paths you include, how many blind paths you include, and, and sort of the resilience of the offer to work in the future. Oh, I see what you're saying. OK, OK, so let me try and rephrase that in my own words, make sure I understand it. Um, so it sounds like, you know, if I if I wanted um, to make an offer that I guarantee is going to work, you know, for, for years to come, you know, provided that I still have this lightning node running on my mobile phone, I could I, I might, you know, because they publish this offer with um, no blinded paths, and and the only like the only you know route hint is just basically to like my phone, and 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 that offer would you know in theory as long as I keep keep the node running on my phone here, that that offer should continue to work into the future, but then the the question then becomes like okay let's say I want privacy, so I take uh, from my you know. My mobile phone wallet. I publish an offer that has a uh, a single blinded path with you know two or three hops along that path. So it's a single blinded path, and I publish that offer onto the internet. Well, if you know two months down the line, one of the nodes along that hop goes down for some reason, then my blinded path basically becomes unusable, and so then the offer I've published becomes unusable to anyone who scans it because 
I've only given them one blinded path and the path is now bad. So I could then further try to improve the resilience of this offer by saying, okay, um, I want to be real future proof about this. I'm going to make uh, an offer that has three blinded paths. And then each of these blinded paths has another two or three hops in there. And I published that author offer. And I can hopefully, you know, guarantee that like this offer probably is going to stand the test of time better. It's, you know, even if one of the hops goes down temporarily or permanently, there's still two other blinded paths on that offer. And so that offer should, you know, remain somewhat private and re remain workable on into the future. But my offer has, you know, kind of ballooned in size because I've added three blinded paths to it. Yeah, that's that's the idea, and and you could have expirations on offers as well. So if you think that you know these uh, uh, these paths aren't going to be there for years to come, you, you could limit the the time the offer is valid. Um, of course, that makes it not as permanent as maybe some people would like. So the, there's some concerns you would have to consider, I guess, or considerations rather uh, around Sorry. that. I yes, just go ahead. See if I understand correctly, because I've made some notes here. Um, Stephen said, but if I want privacy, I publish an offer that has a single blinded path and I publish that and then two months down the line, one of the nodes go down. So the offer I publish becomes not usable. So is this actually um, a usability issue that people or, or builders need to consider when using Vault 12 because, or something that they need to educate users about when creating an offer? Because yeah. if the node goes down, then their offer is no longer valid because there's the, the hops don't work, if I understood correctly. Yeah, that, that's sort of the idea. So I think it's a bit of both usability and you know, ways to educate developers. Uh, mm -hmm. So I guess maybe taking a step back. So you don't need to use blinded paths and offers. It's just a privacy okay. benefit. So if you uh, do not include them, you would typically use your public node ID um, yeah. And that, and then the sender would have to route, just as they route a payment, they would find a route uh, or pathfinding uh, to your public node ID through the public network graph. Um, I think Matt alluded to this in Discord. Um, uh, let me see if I can find the, the actual message. But one sort of nifty thing about this is that, um, you know, you could either have that node ID not be you. It could be like an LSP or it could be um, some other third party. Um, mm -hmm. You could have blinded paths go to, to those such uh, nodes as well if you think they'll be a little more resilient. Um, I haven't really thought too much of this through entirely, but um, maybe just take a, a step slightly back. And, and one thing about offers is that offer is not an invoice. It's a precursor to an invoice. Mm -hmm. So, so when you scan an offer, user scans an offer on um, their wallet. Uh, what would be typically is done is it, the the wallet will construct an invoice request. It will either send it directly to the node ID if it's if there's no blinded paths in the offer um, by finding a route on its own, um, or if there are blinded paths, it would find a, a path from itself to the introduction of that blinded path. Um, because the line path is not a full route, it's just a, or a full path, it's just a partial path, essentially, or it could be full, I suppose, but um, typically it wouldn't be. And once it, so it sends this onion message with this invoice request in it, and that request itself has to have a reply path to know how the, um, the recipient would send the invoice back. That's kind of getting into the weeds, I guess. We not really need to worry too much about that. Um, but the invoice that is returned also has blind paths in it. And those can be different blind paths. So if, for instance, say like um, you have a third party um, is acting on behalf of the recipients initially, uh, the offer might have you know, their node ID or blind paths to that particular uh, person, that third party. Uh, whereas the invoice that's returned may have uh, blind paths to the, the actual recipient of the payment. And that might provide some sort of privacy benefits there. So those are kind of, they're not very fleshed out ideas at this point because it involves more people and, and more complexity, but that's just something to be uh, mindful of, I guess. 
Steven? And I was thinking, oh, mm -hmm. uh, real quick, I was just thinking like somebody, like it almost seems too, Jeff, like the, the, uh, the LSP might be like, if you had an LSP servicing a wallet, like they might be incentivized to, you know, provide like privacy as a benefit to their user or something like, like you could, you know, it almost seems like the, the LSP, you know, with their, their various lightning nodes could, you know, construct some kind of, you know, blinded path for their user. It's like, uh, you know, well, if you, you know, we have our one node that's kind of like closer to the edge of the lightning network and, um, you know, people can't really see what's, you know, if we, if we use that as one of the blinded hops, then, uh, you know, uh, it, it, it shields our users from having, you know, their, their public node, um, you know, their node public key being associated with the payment. So um, it, it almost seems like the blinding, the blinded hops could come from the LSPs and, uh, you, you know, ideally those pops wouldn't go down as frequently because it's like a, a service that they're providing their users. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Off, sorry. Yeah. Off the idea of Steven, I'm just thinking on the UI side of things. Um, I guess you wouldn't really call it a blinded path. You would maybe refer to it as like more privacy. Do you want to, do you want to send this offer with more privacy? then click this button and we'll send it over with more privacy as opposed to calling it a blinded path. Um, so yeah, I don't know, just, just thinking out loud. The, the concept of an offer being a pre to an invoice, I, I didn't, um, I have it written here, an offer is a pre to an invoice, the wallet creates an invoice request. Yeah, a precursor so, to invoice is essentially what I was saying. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I could, I mean, if you have a specific question, I could get, I could delve into it, but I could uh, also resummarize it if you like. Um, so I'm just putting myself in user shoes. So if I create an offer on my phone as a, as a, and I want to send the offer to you, I would send over the QR code to you. And then on your phone, it would receive the QR code and then generate an invoice. So the QR code is essentially delivered out of band. It could be any, it's not through the Lightning Network essentially. So it could be scanned uh, from a website. It, it could be on a, you know, on a post-it note on a wall or something. It, mm -hmm. Whatever way it's communicated, it, it, it's not, um, um, I guess, it, it's not dictated. Um, yeah. Uh, so a user would scan a QR card typically to get this, but they get it through like, um, you know, a tweet, for instance, might have a, a string, which with that QR code, a QR code would be encoding. Um, that's not all right, but essentially their wallet would have to have it input in some manner. Uh, once that happens, uh, the offer, currently there's there's some like parameters you could provide in this invoice request. Um, mm -hmm. the, there's quantity field, which honestly you probably don't need to use, but that's as part of the offers. Um, where you maybe the offer is for a cup of coffee and you could order two cups of coffee. And so you would specify um, you know, two in that quantity. Um, you may add a tip to your, to your um, payment. In that case, you, in the voice request, you would give a little bit more than what is actually required. Whereas mm -hmm. if you didn't need a tip, you would just leave the amount blank and you would get an invoice back with the, the desired amount. Um, so there's a few sort of parameters you could provide to that, but, but largely, um, so the wallet may need to ask the user, okay, how many cups of coffee do you want? Or, or do you want to provide a tip? So th there will be some interaction at that point, um, mm -hmm. or the, the user may need to be prompted with, with, um, with that, the, you know, either quantity, amount, et cetera. Um, those are the, the, the largest two. Um, we can get into currencies later, but there are a concept of actually using denominating offers and currencies other than, than Bitcoin. So, um, it could be in USD and then, but the, the invoice and the invoice requests are always in terms of Bitcoin. So yeah. once the, the wallet sort of sends that request out on the user's behalf, um, this goes through the Lightning Network, um, assuming a path is found and you know, the response comes back with an invoice. And at that point, um, that's, I guess, a question at this point, like, would you need to prompt the user again? I mean, if it's, for a currency other than Bitcoin, then maybe you do because you have to check the exchange rate and see that it hasn't moved too much. Uh, but if it's not, if it's all in Bitcoin, then um, 
maybe it's, it's something that just happens behind the scenes and you just send off the payment. Um, so whether there's a prompt there, I guess that's sort of an open question. Yeah, and Mo, uh, just to provide another, some more context, like this, uh, I mean, like the, the, the invoice, like at this point, I feel like invoice is kind of becoming just technical terminology and not like something the user would have to to deal with because like a lot of, a lot of the stuff he's describing just kind of like happens automatically under the hood. Yeah. So, so like, so like when I scan the offer, the idea is like, uh, um, you know, I'm not sure like what kind of, uh, what payment apps you use in the Netherlands, but like, you know, here we might use cash app or something. And so like, um, you know, uh, a musician uh, might put a QR code for their Venmo username or their cash app username uh, on their tip jar. And then, uh, you, you know, that, that QR code will always work and they can scan it. And if I take out cash app and I scan the QR code and it pops up and says, Hey, how much do you want to pay this person? And I type in, uh, you know, two bucks and hit send. Um, mm -hmm. I think ideally what we're trying to build here is ultimately the, like very much the same UX. Like, um, we, that this, you know, I'm not saying this is happening next week, but hypothetically, that that musician can also have a Bolt 12 offer QR code right there on top of their Cash App and Venmo QR code, and I should be able to take my phone, scan that offer, and then it should pop up and say, "How much do you want to pay this person?" And watch you. And and under the hood, what it's doing is it's saying, "Oh, here's an offer. Do do go through all these blinded paths." Give me an invoice request. Okay, now I've got an invoice. Okay, Stephen, do you want to pay the invoice? Like all that's happening under the hood, but like at the user level, like I think a lot of that will be hidden. Yeah, yeah, and maybe the option of of allowing the person who creates the um, the offer to add privacy benefits to it, um, blinded paths. And, and and Jeff, while you're here on on the line, I'm curious. Um, like I remember with Bolt 11 invoices, like the, the concept of zero amounting them was like controversial for a while and there was like a bug that had to be fixed. Um, but, but can we expect with offers and the invoice requests and all that, can we expect zero amount to um, function in a similar or maybe even better way? Yeah, yeah, zero amounts are supported. You would just leave the amount blank essentially or it, it wouldn't even be a field essentially, it wouldn't even be set and then the in that case the person or the i guess the, the invoice request needs to have the amount set whereas in if whereas if a amount was given in the offer it does not need to be set ah i see so the invoice request does need an amount but the offer doesn't need an amount yeah so what you'll end up having is a invoice coming back that always has an amount in it um, but okay. the offer is the one that has uh, the option of having no amount set so it's almost like we got to think about the flow like this. So, you know, user publishes, let me make this bigger and like zoom in and all this. So it's almost like a uh, user publishes offer. Basically they're, you know, putting a QR code out into the world. Okay. So they, the musician has slapped the offer under their tip jar. And then uh, the sender scans the offer. Alice, the musician, publishes an offer. Bob scans the offer QR code. And um, then when he scans it, Bob's wallet prompts him. How much do you want to pay? Okay. So then after prompts him how much he wants to pay, you know, Bob types in uh, or something to that effect, whatever his wallet user interface looks like. Then uh, Bob's wallet quickly sends an invoice request to Alice's node, gets the invoice uh, back, then pays the invoice. So all that happens, like, and Bob doesn't even know any of this is happening. And you know, and then it um, pops up with confetti on screen and says, "Yay, you paid Alice!" Right? 
So um, it's like uh, there, there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff happening under the hood there. But for for Bob's perspective, he just types in a thousand sats, hit send, and then it just kind of works. Hey, yes, Raj, we had a question. Yeah, uh, I just uh, wanted to know, like, why why is it called an offer? That's a good question, Jeff. Do you have any idea? Yeah. Good question. Uh, well, yeah, I guess like there are other features of offers that are not in the spec right now, but we're in a earlier version that will likely come later. Um, and one of those is um, reoccurring payments. So you may have a um, you know subscription to Netflix, for instance. So it's a sort of they they publish an offer saying, hey, we'll we'll um, give you a month of Netflix at this this rate for this amount. Um, and you can sort of subscribe and and so that's kind of one of the use cases so it, it i guess i'm not sure if there's a better name for it um typically when you think of an offer in the real world it's something that's it kind of implies like a sale or some kind of deal where you're getting something for for um you know maybe at a lower price than you normally would but yeah maybe it's more general term it's a little overloaded yeah i think of it in my mind is kind of like um like, you know, like right now over Lightning, I publish an invoice for you. But with Bolt 12, I'm I'm not I'm not giving you an invoice. I'm offering to give you an invoice. Like, here is an offer. You can take my offer to ask me for an invoice, but right now I'm not giving you an invoice yet. I'm just offering you an invoice. Yeah, that, that's very better way of saying it. Uh, the thing about other use cases, there there's also this concept of an offer for money. So a, you think of that as um, a refund, for instance. So a, if you purchase something on a website um, and you want to return it, they may publish a QR code for you to scan. It's very similar to an offer, but not quite. Um, it's actually under the hood. It looks almost like an invoice request. So they're essentially scanning an invoice request um, and you are sending an invoice to them so that they could pay you the refund. Um, Another use case of this is uh, outside of refunds is an ATM, like a Bitcoin ATM. So you're, you're, um, uh, I guess you will be scanning an invoice request from the ATM on the screen and sending them a invoice. And of course, you have to put the money in the ATM. But once they confirm that you have uh, entered the fiat currency into the ATM, then they would send you Bitcoin. Um, so a little different way of thinking it. You could ignore that for, for the time being, since it's actually an entirely different QR code format. Uh, but that's something else that offer supports. So it's kind of like this is everything that you've mentioned is happening under the hood, because essentially in a real life situation, it's like, I don't know, I go to a hairdresser and the hairdresser says to me, hey, do you want to pay by cash or shall I create you an invoice? So the offer is essentially that verbal conversation between those two people. Like, do you want me to create you an invoice? It's that yeah, it's verbal that conversation way. happening between the person who's had the haircut and the person who's requesting the money. Yeah, yeah. Or it could be you know, sign on the wall. It says, this is how much I charge for these different cuts. And different, you know, if I'm adding shampoo or if I'm trimming your beard or whatever it happens to be, um, this could be posted offers, individual offers. Um, so that's one way to think of it. You could even have, um, so so I, I don't know if like you would necessarily see um, like individual QR codes for different offers for different items you would want to purchase. Um, even if it's like a, a hair salon where typically you only have one purchase, you know, it's just you choose which style or you know which which service you like rather, and you would yeah. scan it. Um, maybe in some situations you would have that, but um, if you're purchasing items on a website. Um, you you may just get a dedicated QR code for your individual offer, you know, your shopping awesome. cart, if you will, where maybe yeah. like the quantity stuff doesn't really make a difference or doesn't make sense because you have multiple items, maybe multiple quantities per item. Uh, there there was some chatter about adding some kind of support for that in the future, but uh, it's it seems like just creating specialized offers per per uh, customer per shopping cart makes more sense. So it's really not a sort of a cart kind of merchant experience. It's really just that one time thing yep. that's yeah. specific to that one person. Exactly. Okay. Yep. 
uh, yeah so uh, one one way like i'm trying to think about it and I, I don't know if it's like the right right way to think but i mean invoice is like an invoice seems to me like to uh, is like a is like an abstraction over a payment like you know like it's it it, it is one step above like you know like a like a unilateral payment and then this offer seems to be like something to generate the invoice so that is one more level abstracted from an invoice does that make sense like is it sort of the right way to think about it yeah yeah i think so your your an offer is used to request an invoice and invoices uh, or uh, yeah invoices essentially a recursor or a precursor to a payment or a pay, or invoices paid with a you know lightning payment mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. I'm just uh, mocking up uh, how this might work a little bit. I, I don't know why. I just wanted to really visualize the uh, fact that an offer and uh, you know is this kind of how it's gonna how it's gonna be in the real world. I think or this is how we what we're kind of hoping for is that it perfectly creates this self custodial tip jar. And I think like yeah, the just point that there's a lot of things that Bolt Twelve can do, and I think like right now specifically with offers i'm very narrowly focused on like how do we make this happen right here how do we make the perfect um self-custodial tip jar um where someone can just reuse this thing over and over again and it goes to their lightning wallet it doesn't have to be like lightning address where it, it's you know going through some company's l and url server um and, and there's the risk it can be cut off that would this would be like the the golden example of of a successful bull 12 offer for me and then a lot of the other kind of stuff i think are, are like they're they're good they're good stuff but i think that um you know so, some of that stuff will just kind of take care of itself when we when we get to it so i think you know okay alice has this on the side of her guitar case or whatever so like any sensible person i decided to tipper in Bitcoin. So I scan the offer. So I pull out uh, my phone here and hit the scan button on there. And then I get a scan screen that looks very, very much like that. Um, actually, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then what happens next? Let's find, let's go back to the send screen. I'm just ripping stuff from the Bitcoin UI kit for now just to save. So sending your content, scan a QR code. Um, we actually kind of want these things to be uh, a little bit um, reversed, come to think of it. We have some, we have some uh, flows in the guide that I think are a little bit different than this. Let's see, doing good, spending wallet. Where is the prototype? Direct link to the design file here. Now, there should be one for where you need to send and you initiate by scanning first. Yeah. Okay. So that's the that's the funny thing with this one is that it goes. Uh, we're we're so used to the ordinary lightning paradigm where the uh, um, uh, the amount is kind of like uh, baked in with the uh, the invoice, and so uh, we need to remember that that's not going to happen with Bolt Twelve. So we don't want it to. The amounts being baked into invoices is. Um, Kind of annoying, and it's 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 not how we 
um, we think of things when we're, you know, using traditional fintech apps. So we want to think about it kind of like this, I think. So send Bitcoin. So we're going to send to Jane here. And So we, we give our phone screen, we type scan, we scan the offer, we get here, but the amount is uh, undefined at the, at the beginning. So we have to type in our amount, we have to tap that field there and fill in the amount. So we tap it, we type in 2000 sats or whatever, you know, brings up the iOS uh, little keyboard menu thing. Our send button is now enabled and then um, it should work, we hope. I'm just live designing and thinking out loud. So anyone feel free to interrupt me, talk about whatever you want. You want to share that Figma file? I'd like to kind of jump in and sure. see what you're doing. I just uh, forked a Bitcoin UI kit. And cool. Um, I just kind of forked it. And I created a page at the top called Vault 12. And how do you see, you know, if we're going to publish this as like UX guidance, we'll um, clean it up and make some of the examples like hyper specific. I'm just kind of trying to find um, pre existing screens that kind of have uh, like the majority of the stuff already laid out. Uh, Steven, so I was just mm -hmm. like wondering what is the uh, uh, what is the missing stuff that you know requires a different UX than a regular Bitcoin payment? Well, we hope it doesn't. That's the that's the ideal thing. But we don't want to overcomplicate the. We don't want to reinvent the wheel here. So hopefully, nothing has to change. But the the problem that um, we're worried about primarily is just the fact that it uses a different QR code. Um, so. Uh, hold on one second. Let me find the screen I was looking for, and then I'll uh, get back to that. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, there we go. That's nice. These will be handy. There we go. That's what I was looking for. Um, uh, that's not the right one. I have two files called Bolt 12. Um, yeah, so the, the main thing we're worried about, Yashraj, is that the uh, the QR code is different. And we're uh, concerned uh, chiefly right now with the period of um, partial support for Bolt 12, um, where, uh, you know, let's say um, Alice's wallet um, starts supporting Bolt 12 and they default to uh, they want to default create offers, you know, every time she wants to receive Bitcoin, but then other wallets don't support it yet. And, and that's a problem. And so we're trying to, um, that creates, you know, friction and the user experience. If somebody's wallet doesn't support Bolt 12 and um, then they try to scan it and it doesn't work. And then, you know, they just say, Alice, your QR code doesn't work. And then, you know, they spend a, a couple minutes in a, noisy bar trying to figure out QR codes and ultimately give up and say, screw Bitcoin. Yeah. Um, so kind of, kind of, what, you know, what I'm hoping here is that we can just cram three QR code, three, three payment formats into one QR code here, uh, an on-chain, a Bolt 11 and a Bolt 12. And um, then ideally one QR code to serve them all and every lightning wallet should or Bitcoin wallet just on chain wallet should be able to scan this and should just be totally okay with it. But if that doesn't, so we have to do some testing for that, but if that doesn't work, then we're going to have to do some kind of probably some kind of tab design. I'm guessing like if I go to like my strike page here, um, like 
So just by default, it pulls up with a Bolt 11 Lightning invoice, but then if I swap over here, it goes to an on-chain address. We're gonna have to do something like that. Um, uh, so one uh, one thing I was wondering is if like uh, being being digital and being like like physical, does it like make a difference? Like in like in terms of I'm like imagining like a dystopic world in which there is a QR code on a wall somewhere, and that's like you know, if you can reach it, it, it will pay you so you can you know like survive or something you know like so that I cannot change that uh, QR code once I put it up. Um. Yeah, uh, but me, like in uh, the digital realm, I can change it like from time to time if I have to. Uh, so I see you're the reason you've used the word dystopic is because you're talking about like a situation where the user can't change that QR code. Yeah, yeah, I guess. Well, I, I mean, I think that they could certainly change it just by uh, they could certainly change the QR code just by making a new one. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there, there, there's no limit to the number of uh, QR codes that they can make. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. Like, you know, it's kind of like um, uh, this one right here is uh, like obviously a Cash App one. You never have to change that, but that's kind of because it's centralized. And so Cash App kind of, mm -hmm. they always route you to the right place, no matter, mm -hmm. um, no matter, uh, you know, what you do. Um, I, I mean, I think that the, the innovation with an offer is that you now have that same flexibility in a self-custodial way to create this offer that's reusable. But there's no, there's no, there's nothing to say that um, the user is compelled to use that offer forever. Um, in fact, that's actually a good point that you bring up because when you think about it, um, let's say I do. You need to almost have a way to kind of like burn an offer. Um, uh, it's probably a bad uh, word to use because it probably sounds very ETH, but like uh, you got to think like um, if my note, well, well, here's the thing. Let's say I lose my lightning wallet. So I lose the phone that created this lightning wallet. Um, then effectively this node goes offline. Like if the, you know, once this phone powers down, this, this node is gone. And so Anybody who tries to pay um, to use the offer to pay me, even if I've put my QR code, you know, uh, on every the wall of every single bar in Atlanta, um, that, that that offer is going to fail to pay me because my node has gone offline because you know my phone got dropped in a lake or something. Um, yeah. So so that's good. So I can just get a new phone, download you know new Lightning Wallet, ideally you know restore it, but um, I can make a new offer at that point. But then we got to think about like other situations, like maybe, um, maybe uh, for whatever reason, I want to stop using this offer. Um, maybe it's because I've suddenly become, you know, concerned about privacy and my identity and all this stuff. And I'm like, well, I want to start fresh. I don't want anybody paying me through that offer, but I still want to keep using the same Lightning wallet. I just don't want to use that offer. So it seems like there's got to be a way somewhere in my wallet menu to kind of like revoke offer. And so, um, you know, that there's gotta be a way to like, here's your existing offers and do you wanna revoke any of them? Like, in other words, basically like, if another lightning node tries to contact my lightning node and do an invoice request against that offer, it says, no, won't do that. Yeah, yeah. So that makes sense. So I think we have a couple of like a uh, couple of scenarios which like require a UX now, which is not you know required if it's an on-chain thing. Yeah, you're right. So maybe maybe that's something we think about. Like you know maybe like offers like you know settings menu. How does user um, revoke an offer they no longer wish to receive payment from? And then I guess kind of another thing about this is, um, so we had to think about like uh, privacy. Um, how much do we communicate to the user about how private or not private their offer is? 
Um, I mean, it, you know, in a perfect world, we just, um, I think what we really want to do is we want to um, uh, be able to hand users, you know, this perfect level of privacy um, that they don't even have to think about. And it's just kind of enabled by default. Um, I think that would be amazing. Um, but we, we do kind of have to contend with, at least in the short term, the fact that these uh, um, blinded offers, you know, the more blinded and the more resilient it is, um, the, the less private it will be. Um, and then that might change over time if we can figure out some of these novel mechanisms, like kind of the one Jeff was talking about, about if you can have some kind of, uh, you know, other node that passes the invoices, you know, provides, services invoice requests against your node maybe that would be an option um or, or maybe it just gets to the point where um you know all the phone cameras are getting so good that we just no longer care about the, the size of the qr codes all these things are possibilities or it could get to the point where um you know so many we have such widespread bolt 12 support across the industry that we no longer need to do bit 21 with on chains and bolt 11s and we can shrink the size of the qr code from there and then the offers portion of the QR code can get bigger because we can cram more blinded paths in there. That's a possibility too. But in the short term, we're going to have this messy window where I think I think I think any Bolt 12 offer solution that rolls out in the year 2023 is probably going to be something like this. It's going to be something like you have the easy QR code, which it will 100% work. Um, It'll 100% work, probably, maybe. <laughs> um, and it's not going to be the most private thing, but it's private enough. And then you're going to have the like super private QR code, um, uh, the super private QR code that you know maybe you, is is going to be a little bit harder to read. People are used to that a little bit. I mean, I think that like people are kind of used to this idea of like like. I always bring up Signal as my like privacy, my beautiful privacy use case um, sort of thing where they really protect the user and don't let them screw things up. And uh, I'm trying to think about like, you know, what if you had like this like Bolt 12 app that's like, you know, um, you know, hey, I want to create um, a payment code or something like that. And, you know, you tap it and it generates an offer for you and it has like your little profile picture in the center of the QR code. And that's the kind of thing that you can go slapping up on stickers on the side of your guitar case. It's a, a very uh, simple offer and it's not the most private thing, but it's like, it's simple and it um, uh, it's easy to scan uh, from six feet away in a dark bar. Right. And then you have like a special mode in the app that's like, sneaky payments or private payments or whatever and that generates like a you know we, we kind of bill it as like kind of like a one use offer but it's like an offer with like three blinded paths in there that you can you know give to somebody for like a super private payment or something like that um you th that might be the offer that you want to publish on like your uh that might be the offer that you publish um, like on your Nostra profile or something like that, when you want to see it, receive anonymous tips from randos on the internet and you don't want them like snooping on your traffic, you know? Uh, that's another thing to consider about this whole thing is that one Lightning Wallet can have multiple offers. So like maybe, maybe it's like, um, maybe a way of thinking about this for the short term because the private ones are larger is that you have like the like the meat space offer and the cyberspace offer. Yeah, I think to your point that like QR codes are only necessary if you're using a camera to to communicate the offer. If yeah. you're using a tweet or a text message or whatever other method mechanism, copy and pasting, um, you know, these could be very long. Yeah, so it's like, okay, well, it generates QR code offer that is far less blinded, but far easier to read. But then, you know, if you want to say like, um, uh, but then, well, it generates longer, more private, you know, more blinded offer for 
things like master, alt 12 address, etc. Like maybe we're thinking about it in the UI, like we're not we're not like telling the user like, hey, you're creating an offer here. It's like we're we're um, you know, there's like some button that's like a you know a tap to create payment QR code, and it's just making this real simple, really lean, lightweight offer BIP21 offer QR code. And then when you say like tap to receive money over Noster, tap here to create your Bolt 12 address, it's generating something you know much more private and much longer and all of that with the expectation that you know uh, you, it, you know they're they're going to share it over you know a digital platform and not putting it in meet space on a QR code. Yeah, uh, I mean, all of this is so, you know, fascinating. And I think the, the design space, like, it seems to me like the design space is so, so large because, like, the problem space is so large, too, right? I mean, all these scenarios. Yeah. This definitely, it also definitely has some really good use cases. So I definitely understand why you guys are trying to bring more eyes to it and get more devs, more wallet developers on board with, um, with offering this to users. Um, it might be interesting maybe on another call to talk about use cases and um, maybe educating you know, developers about particular use cases. So that might also help with buy-in. Um, so getting them to really understand the different use cases and how it can benefit the users, or that kind of thing. Also stuff to put on the website. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, this has been super productive uh, talking yeah. about all of this. I'm glad. Uh, yeah, I'm glad you chimed in, Yashraj, because it really helped me to kind of think about uh, some of these other ways of uh, looking at this. Um, and then I'll just throw in the kind of classic problem of like, okay, um, you know, which QR code to default to. Um, um, add sign to access legacy QR codes, et cetera. So those are kind of like maybe four, four kind of problems from UI perspective to think about. OK, we're kind of like on the hour here. So I think I'm going to like uh, probably um, wrap up and uh, get uh, off of a call, unless anybody has any like final questions or comments or they want to talk to me about before, um, before I bail. Uh, it's been a good one. It's been pretty interesting. I, I never fully got my brain around what Vault 12 was, but now I do after this call. So uh, so thanks for that. Of course. Yeah, thanks for organizing. All right, cool. I'm going to keep uh, plugging away at the uh, at the Figma here uh, later day, and I'll uh, you know keep posting updates in the Discord. Uh, thanks for joining, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Bye.